And I think I, because this is this is my first novel, and and I'm assuming that uh, most people who are out with their first novel, they may have written, I know, a poetry or, mm. or a short story, but I had never ever made anything up. Mm. I knew how to tell a story using historical documents, but to make up a story was completely new to me. Uh, Sigrun Pausdotter completed a PhD in the history of ideas at the University of Oxford in 2001, after which she was a research fellow and lecturer at the University of Iceland. She worked as the editor of Saga, the principal peer-reviewed journal for Icelandic history from 2008 to 2016. Her previous titles include the historical biography Thora, A Bishop's Daughter, and Uncertain Seas, a story of a young couple and their three children who were killed when sailing from New York to Iceland aboard a ship torpedoed by a German submarine in 1944. Her most recent book, History, A Mess, is a novel that follows an unnamed narrator who, while at work on her dissertation, thinks she has discovered evidence of Britain's first female professional artist. We learn, however, that this discovery is nothing more than a misreading, the result of two pages of a diary stuck together. History A Mess is a sharp and clever novel that brings into question what we consider the archive to be, how we interact with it, and the nature of belief itself. Sigrun's work has been nominated for the Icelandic Literary Prize, Icelandic Women's Literature Prize, um, the DV Culture Prize, and Uncertain Seas was chosen as the best biography in 2013 by booksellers in Iceland. Shout out to all the booksellers in Iceland. <laughs> uh, joining her in conversation tonight will be Lytton Smith, who translated History a Mess. We're very, very excited to have Lytton here into its English version. He's a poet, translator, and professor, and has translated many, many works from the Icelandic into English. His most recent poetry collection, The All-Purpose Magical Tent, was published by Nightboat, and he currently teaches at SUNY Genesio. I think I'm saying that right. I don't know my New York City names. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are absolutely thrilled to have both of these writers here with us tonight, so please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, read uh, a short chapter from this novel here, um, I want to tell you a long story. <laughs> I promise I keep it very short. I've written it down here. Um, In the Depression winter of 1897, the New York socialite Cornelia Bradley Martin decided to throw the greatest party in the history of the city. It was a costume ball, not an old-fashioned masquerade, but a formal event where guests were requested to dress up as historical characters, preferably as royalty of early modern Europe. The outcome was a costly manifestation of wealth, display of diamond and relics, some of which should have been kept in museums or some more safe places than around the necks and waist of the new writs on the dance floor of the <laughs> Waldorf Hotel, transformed for the occasion into a replica of Versailles. Indeed, Cornelia herself, as Mary Queen of Scots, wore a massive diamond and ruby choker once belonged to Marie Antoinette. History a mess. One of the 1,200 guests invited was Brenda Anderson, a wealthy single woman and the author of then newly published biography of Guðríður Þorbjarnadóttir, an Icelandic explorer who, along with her husband, led an expedition to Winland in North America around the year 1000. Brenda detested the idea behind Cornelia's ball, what she saw as a pathetic attempt of the new writs to overcome their lack of refinement, tradition, and history, their desire for what their money could not buy, blue blood. But instead of staying home grumpy, Brenda decided to show up at Versailles, New York City, with a statement. She would go as her hero, Guðríður, the Icelandic woman who had discovered America some 500 years before the king and queen of Spain, present at the ball, mm. sponsored the voyage of Christopher Columbus. Dressed in a plain but elegant wool gown with an old leather belt around her waist, Brenda certainly stood out on the dance floor among the pseudo kings and queens, and although few could guess her costume, with explanation, she had achieved her goal. To draw attention to what she saw as the real beginning of American history. Or so she thought, until she stumbled over a giant, the rebellious lawyer Richard Welling, dressed up as an Indian chief, right behind him young Anne Morgan, 
the daughter of G.P. Morgan, as Pocahontas. Um, well, uh, this is all made up, the, the bit about Brenta, that is to say. She is the um, character in my latest novel that we published within uh, two weeks. Um, but Brenta could have existed. And uh, the reason I mention this here is that it's such a good example of the disputable historical significance of the famous first and what it means to be the first in, in this and, and that. Uh, what does it mean if I, I find or identify a female painter which is born three years earlier than the, the first female painter that we thought was the first? Well, I would say it depends on the, the context, but this woman here, when she does, she thinks history should be rewritten um, with uh, terrible consequences, as you can see, this diluting here uh, on the mm. cover. But um, before I read the chapter, it looks like I'm postponing it. <laughs> <endlessly>. <laughs> I want to read from another book. This book is called Kompa, and this is the Icelandic version of, 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 of History MS. And uh, I want to just to read uh, just a short paragraph, the beginning, this, the same beginning I, I will read for you later. Um, um, just this bit, so you will hear how, how the Icelandic language um, sounds like. Well, it starts with English. This day, after I was ready, I did eat my breakfast. Dagur 208, og þar með hafði ég skrifa þessa setningu upp 201 sinni og í framhaldinu þær málsgreinar sem mynduðu dagbókar færslu hvers dags. Þetta hafði nú þegar tekið um það bil sex mánuði því þrátt fyrir sífeldar endutekningar voru blæbriðu tungumálsins í þessari fornu tekstakásu yfirleitt nægilega mikil til að kosta með töluverða vinnu. Niðurstaðan var þá ávallt svo sama. Það var ekkert í þessu. Ekkert annað en formfastur og fremar andlaus vitnisburður um þá brotna tilveru sem erfitt var að gefa mikla merkingu jafnvel þótt hún væri 365 ára gömul. En ég varð víst að klára, halda áfram að fletta, halda áfram að reyna í það sem ekkert var og það gerði ég þar til hún blasti við mér, miklu lengri en allar hinar fæslutnar, heil opna með einni og aðeins einni yfirskrift, The Day 203. So. This day, after I was ready, I did eat my breakfast. Day 201. And with these words, I had written the same sentence out 201 times, and following on from it, the paragraph comprising its journal entry. The task had already taken me about six months, despite the incessant repetition, the linguistic nuances in this cramped ancient manuscript were significant enough to cause me considerable labors. And still the result was always the same, nothing of note nothing but a rigid, rather uninspiring testimony to a humble existence, an existence to which it was practically impossible to accord any greater meaning, even though it was 365 years old. But I was determined to finish, to keep following the threat, to keep scrutinizing nothing, and so, it did, and so I did until it hit me, much longer than all the other entries, a piece that opened with one and only one heading, the day 203. This was around noon, but by the time I had made my way through both pages, it was a closing time at the library. I looked at my transcription. It took me a little while to fully realize what I had discovered. And here comes the, the cru crucial entry. It's a 17th century text uh, written by me, but I will spare you <laughs> um, and go on uh, from where it's end. The custodian of the manuscript library, a young, athletic man, rested his hand lightly and just for a moment on my shoulder. Then he tapped the index finger of, my, of, of the same hand against his delicate watch. I closed the book at once, returned it to its box and gave it to him. I gathered my things together, rose from the table, walked out of the room, slowly passing along the long hallway, all the way trying to hold back the smile that played behind my lips. 
There was no doubt that the creator of the famous portrait of Viscount Tom Jones was my diary writer, S.B., but could it be that S.B. was a woman? A trailblazer, had I just found a new beginning in the history of Western art? Frenzied jubilation thrilled through my body, words burst within me, freighted with tremendous power inside my head, sentences and then pages formed one after the other, so that by the time I stepped out of the building, into the outside courtyard, my introduction was well underway. Out on the street, nothing was the same. I wasn't the same. I could sense it in the slightest gesture, the way my arm, arms swung back and forth, my hips moving rhythmically side to side, my hair billowing in the warm spring breeze. And by the time I had turned into the path that leads to the church and gone past a young man with a guitar, at which point I entirely, entirely surprised myself by letting a 10 pound note float down into his case, my thesis was fast taking shape. It was practically fully formed by the time I left the city center. Those beautiful surroundings to which I belonged during the day and which made all my minuscule, dispensable thoughts about life in centuries past worth anything each day. Reflection which had hitherto somewhat lost their meaning when I, at the end of my workday, left the ancient buildings and headed home to the grim, inescapable existence that was a part of the city low-rise precast concrete houses, grouped in long rows, washed out in a monotone overcoat the color of cream. Seventies residences that seemed about to collapse under the conflicts taking place inside them. My neighbor slammed her front door behind her and strode rapidly away from the house while the shouting from inside her home fell silent. I do not remember how she responded to my greetings as as we passed. I was lost in my reflection, unaware whether I said hello to her. So deep was I in the thought over the day's discovery. By now, I had the whole introduction in my head. Time for a preface. Mm. Thank you. Mm. <coughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Sigrun. Um, uh, so Sigrun and I are going to um, talk uh, for a little bit about uh, the book and, and the translation. Um, I've got some questions for her. We'll, we'll see where the conversation goes. And um, after that, we'll uh, open up the floor uh, for you to, uh, to ask questions. Um, uh, and I do want to, uh, as we begin, I just want to thank Brookline Booksmith for, for supporting us, um, for supporting translation as well, um, because um, uh, only 3% of the, the, the books published in the US every year are in translation. Um, those books also tend to sell a lot less well than, than, than other books. and, and um, uh, you know, we need champions of literature and translation to bring the world to us. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to Brookline Booksmith, also to Sigrun for traveling all this way to, to join us. Um, and uh, I, I loved um, hearing about the, the new novel as a translator. I'm super excited to get my hands on that and, and hopefully translate that and hopefully for, for open letter books. Um, uh, it seemed fitting that you started with a historical anecdote tonight and, and, and the opening of this novel is, is very historical. Um, so I wonder if we could sort of begin the, the question and answer with you talking a little bit about what it means to 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 be or have been a, a historian, right? That's that's sort of crucial to your identity, and and then to to uh, to become perhaps a novelist. I mean, are, are those two identities um, actually overlapping for you? Are they quite different? How do they work together? Well, I think from from uh, early age, I was sort of determined to to do something creative. Mm -hmm. But when you're young, you're you need a strong vision, vision, and and you need to be quite courageous to to start to to make things mm. things up, and I just didn't. I don't think I had um, enough courage to do that. Mm. So I, I I went to university to sort of gather my strength, and I was there for for quite a long time until mm. I I was <laughs> ready to 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 go on and and uh, write a novel because mm. it's uh, yeah it's it's. Uh, and I think I, because this is this is my first novel, and and I'm assuming that uh, most people who are out with their first novel, they may have written, I don't know, a poetry or, mm. or a short story, but I had never ever made anything up. Mm. I knew how to tell a story using historical documents, but to make up a story was completely new to me, and you know I was. Uh, approaching the uh, 
the, um, the age of 50, and, and so it was quite, quite, uh, quite a dif difficult step, I must say. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm also f fascinated as well. I mean, I think the, the title of the journal, for which, which was sort of the historical journal for which you were editor, Saga, I mean, mm. it's, it's a word that um, it's difficult to translate into English because it brings together meanings that, are, that uh, we separate in, in English to some extent, but it, it can be a, a word for sort of talking about or implying storytelling, yeah. right, as well yeah. as the discipline of history. So those things seem closely overlapped in, in, in Icelandic culture, I think. Yeah, a saga with, with an article is, is history. Right. But but if you say saga, it means it would mean a story right. generally. But sagan, uh, that with an article, that would be be history. So right. it's it's not completely the the, the same. Not right. not in my mind. Right. So you least. don't you yeah. don't see those two. Yeah, together. I mean I, I I see what you what you what you mean. But but um, I'm thinking about this this little article that. Right. Uh, uh, it's like the, the history. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, and, and as as um, uh, as the introduction made clear, you have sort of you've written biography um, yeah. uh, and and sort of moved through time periods as you've written biography. Um, did you think of this? I mean, obviously, this is a made-up character, but yeah. are you writing her biography in, in a kind of way? Is is there a you know, or is it a completely different creative act for you? Uh, well, I mean. She's 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 made up right. and and uh, and it's a it's a first per person narrative. Yep. So I I guess uh, part of me is is is, uh -huh. is her. Right. I I share some of her thoughts and resentment and irritation <laughs> and but it's the, and, and I did a PhD as, mm -hmm. as but I didn't have the experience and and there's a. There's a crime uh, censored <laughs> to the plot, so, so definitely it's not me. <laughs> we we can edit the crimes out on, yeah, on television yeah. later. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, so uh, um, uh, the this sort of leads on to, to one of the other questions I, I had to ask you. I mean, the, the the process of translating is this is sort of fascinating sort of conversation or, or sort of dance back back and forward and many minds at a meeting. Um, um, but I think the the narrator here, the the protagonist, she has a a very um, particular and very fascinating way of sort of seeing and thinking about the mm. world mm. Um, as you were writing how did you come up with that style did it find you were you trying to create it I have no idea this, <laughs> this is a long time ago I um, I know that much that I didn't uh, sit down to to write this uh, uh, this book about uh, an historian hmm. um, I think it may have started with images and collection of, of, of memories. I was at the time fascinated by hallucinations mm -hmm. because of my own experience as a, as a child. So I, I, I started with that and so I needed a, uh, a woman going, going through crisis. Right. And I, I didn't see it as a, as a character study, rather as an experiment in, in narration right. using hallucination and um, and illusion yeah. as, a, as, a, as a way to, um, you know, draw up the, the story. Right. And in the in the first version, um, there was only this subplot that uh, that is the, the plot with a, with a notebook uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the, the young woman, mm -hmm. the notebook that ends up in the hands of the mother, with um, with a sort of the with a, the, this this beautiful prose that he, she writes to her to her mother mm -hmm. that sort of wipes out be, because of accident and the only thing that's left in the the notebook is the that terrible sort of rant that she she writes uh, uh, about her mother so but the 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 major plot that came in in earlier uh, no, late, later in the states the, these plots are sort of similar mm -hmm. it's all about misreading yeah things and and things that are, are preserved and mm -hmm. and get sort of lost right and um, and and the, the, the plot about the historian came as, as I said uh, much much later because I yeah. uh, in the first draft it was only these um, it was only this 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 um, this subplot and and my uh, my publisher wasn't very happy about it uh, and he wanted to know why why she was going through this crisis so I, that's how I, I i i decided that she was was 
I, I may have had it in the back of my mind, mm -hmm. but I decided that she would be a historian and make this this terrible mistake. And um, instead of rewriting the novel, I wrote the the plot and sort of passed thread through the novel. Yep. Yep. And the, the the plot is quite sort of simple and and um, and it's it's quite sort of the opposite of what the, the book how the book is written and mm -hmm. and I think that's that's why people mm. think it's a strange book because it has this element of this inward looking mm -hmm. point of view right. and then this very sort of small crime mm -hmm. simple plot right so yeah I guess um, writing this book was a bit of a mess because I didn't have a quite sort of concrete idea yeah no uh, yeah but or, or you know uh, the, the idea it sounds like it's, it's sort of come into formation which seems very yeah. fitting yeah I, I, I guess I, I guess that that's the case with with you know any writer I, I, yeah. I don't know so yeah. what, it's I think it's particularly important for this book uh, though I mean so the, the poet Charles Simich the translator Charles Simich has, has talked about um, translation is the closest possible reading you can ever do of, of a book and I think that's the the, the, the the sort of humbling honor of being a translator is that you get to read the books that you translate much more thoroughly than anything else you'll ever read in your life and the experience of reading this book um, and, and, and those of you in the audience who haven't read it yet will, will get to do this is that um, I, I would read a chapter and think okay as a reader I know something Right, mm. I, I've been told something, and then in the next chapter it would get unpicked, mm. right, and I'd say, oh, I maybe I don't know that, right, and it fits into the genre of the unreliable narrator, mm. but it's not quite that. She's not trying to deceive anybody. She's just, you know, she's uncertain, mm. uh, you know, and these genuine moments where, you know, even at times having translated it, I'm still thinking, well, was there a door on the wall or was, wasn't, yeah. you know, and I, and I have mm. an answer, but I also you know, I like to not have an answer. So, um, you know, how, yeah, how comfortable were you with that? Did you, you know, did you want there to be sort of firm, clear answers? Or are you sort of happy dwelling in that uncertainty and not knowing? Um, it's, it's difficult to recollect what, what mm -hmm. actually happens right. when you, when you're writing. Right. Because, because often I would, would listen to an interview with a writer and, and you know, they would tell me that the, the story wrote itself, mm -hmm. and I would say, well, of course it doesn't. But, <laughs> but once you you at it yourself, you 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 realize it's it's ahead of you all the time. Right, and, right. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that I, I frustrate my students all the time by telling them that that they think they're writing poems, but yeah. actually the poems are really writing themselves, yeah. and we have to get out of the way. And then yeah. um, that, that's. But, but about the the process, because I remember asking you whether you you preferred. To, to translate a chapter and then sent it to me, I would mm -hmm. see if it was, was if you were understanding things right. right. And you said, no, 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 no. I want to understand the story until yeah. I, 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 I've, I've finished it. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that that is my, you know, my, my process is, is sort of you know needing to have the yeah, whole yeah. thing, which I think okay. it's you know I, I think as a novelist you're often writing the draft and mm. getting to the end and mm. and then it, it fits together. Um, one of the the conversations that Sigrun and I had even almost before I started translating, to translating the book, was over the title, right? Mm, and you very yeah. elegantly at the start alluded to the fact that you're holding, I'll show these up, but you're holding you know, two books tonight, yeah. right? So there's, there's Compa <laughs> and then there's History of Mass, right? Mm. And um, so can you talk a little bit about that process of, you know, because the History of Mass is not a direct translation no. of Compa. So can you talk a little bit about, about that and, 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 and how that was for you? Well, um, so Kampa in, in Icelandic uh, has two two uh, different meanings. It means a little cubby hole, as you mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. a lit little room, like a closet or or, or small windowless room, and also uh, a notebook. And it fitted completely with mm -hmm. with 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 my story because there's a there's a little room there and there's a notebook, mm -hmm. both the, the manuscript and the, the notebook of the historian, but. Uh, Getting these combined in an English title was, yeah, very, <laughs> <laughs> very right. difficult. And and choosing um, either one would, you know, you don't mm. you don't uh, include uh, a room a word room in a, right. in a, in a, in a book title. Yes. Which is room right. And a notebook. Yeah, right. No, you don't do that. Right. Right. <laughs> Too many books about right. about notebooks. So, right. Right. So yeah. And we, yeah, we, we came up with, with several titles and um, I guess I wanted to um, emphasize the, uh, 
the historical speculation of, of, of the book because um, critics were very sort of focused on her um, mental illness and, and mm -hmm. her uh, relationship with the mother and, and, and of course that's that's uh, that's a very in, important part mm -hmm. of the book but I um, I wanted to 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 draw attention to 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 history mm -hmm. and 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 what I think is the sort of major uh, it's not an agenda but but there is a there is some some message about how we um, how historians uh, read historical mm -hmm. document uh, the, the selective reading because uh, mm -hmm. when you when you are researching uh, an old manuscript 17th century manuscript you need a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. You need to be very well read in the literature in the field, but as soon as otherwise you you won't understand a thing. But this knowledge makes you a very selective reader. Mm. So you might um, skip something which would be totally new, mm. which not would not be found in the theoretical literature. Mm -hmm. So, and that that's 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 the major problem in the books. Uh, yeah. Her reading. Of the as soon as she has uh, got this this cue that this this uh, writer is a woman, her reading completely changes, mm. and she reads every she reads a feminine um, meaning into into everything that she uh, every word of the the manuscript. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, and, and I mean I think as you know, translating it, it felt that. Um, you know that has important resonances for sort of how we are approaching the world we live in at mm. the moment sort of you know globally in terms mm. of sort of the you know maybe projecting our own imaginations onto the world or, or not sort of looking at what's in front of us um, yeah. so so hopefully that that you know that history ms translation it's not a translation it's an adaptation in that yeah. sense but mm. it offers something that i think speaks to mm. to the birth yeah so, um, We've started to, to touch on th this question, which I think is, is a fascinating one for Icelandic authors, um, and, and maybe specifically for, for you yourself, because the uh, one of the biographies that, that was alluded to in, in, in the introduction is, is the story of, of an Icelandic couple who, who are coming to, to, to America uh, during the Second World War, and so we're actually sort of seeing America through Icelandic eyes, um, as well as learning, you know, this this story and this ultimately this this, this tragedy um, uh, that, that befalls them, um, um, and. Um, uh, so the question I, I want to get to is that sense of um, uh, there's a, a, a small Icelandic language readership, right? Mm. A very vibrant, a very enthusiastic readership, but um, uh, but there's also a much wider uh, audience for, for Icelandic writing in, in German, in, in English, and in, in French. And so, is that sense that it might have a, a, an audience beyond uh, Iceland or sort of the wider Icelandic community and in sort of North America and elsewhere? Is that in your mind ever as you write? Is that a does it affect the writing? Well, the, the, the sort of the general rule um, of a writer, he should never think about uh, his reader. <laughs> But um, but he can never escape the escape the thought. He he wants them to to like his book, but he doesn't want to please them. Mm -hmm. It's like you only need to uh, you know if, if you, you you're all aware of the, the sentences. You know, Lytton Smith won't let his his fans down or his uh -huh, readers. Right. And what does that mean? Does right. that mean that you you're writing the same book again and uh -huh. again? And yeah. and you don't want that either. So so that's a that's a bit tricky, but um, yeah, I, it, it is extremely important. Uh, the population of, of Iceland is about three hundred sixty thousand, and it's it's to to get through to to a wider audience. It is it is important. Mm. Um, not only, I mean, to be you know, you can think of it as an appeal. You know, if you get a bad reviews. <laughs> Let's see what I do in the States. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> just you wait. <laughs> no, just not to, to, to lose hope. And and it's not only only that. It's it has to do with how literature is treated mm. uh, in Iceland. You know, we you, you have this you may have this image of us as the, the book nations and we, we publish more book uh, per uh, Per capita, I think, yeah, per yeah, 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 and and 
we said yeah and then write more books and, right. and yeah but um, the way it is done you can see it just here um, this is hardback and you rarely I mean see uh, like sort of soft cover in, mm. in Iceland and that is because uh, a book in Iceland is it's not on only for you to to buy and uh, read it it is essentially a, a gift a mm -hmm. christmas gift and this is the, the famous icelandic book flood mm -hmm. and the icelandic um, publishing um, industry doesn't have capacity to publish year round it needs this explosion so mm -hmm. to speak so ev most of the books are published uh, in october and november and everybody goes buying books not for themselves but to 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 give somebody right. and it's it's a very charming tradition right. but the the drawback of it is is that in october uh, people start writing reviews and there are tv shows and and you know they're, it's all about the books and and uh, but on on, uh, on Christmas Day, everything falls silent. Ah, yeah. Right. So that's it's not very cultivated. I, I, I just <laughs> right. so it's it's a it's um it's a marketing strategy, and it mm. is is useful, and, and perhaps we don't have a choice. Right. But now they're they're starting to publish a little bit in in the spring as well, but but sort of gradually the year around it doesn't really exist. Mm. Right, right. No, that makes sense. And I'm, 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 I'm cause, you know, to me, the the only equivalent that we might have out here is the idea of sort of like the summer reading or the beach yeah, reads, yeah, right? We don't, book, yeah. right? You know, we don't have that 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 moment quite so much. And, and I was over in Iceland in, in April and sort of working with some folks from the um, uh, the Icelandic um, Literature Centre and. and you know, some of the surveys they do, they sort of ask questions about, well, how many books did you give and receive this this Christmas season? How many did you actually read? And mm. that would be an unlikely focus question, I would yeah. say, right? For us yeah. to sort of, you know, that's not quite the same thing. Um, um, in just a second, I want to open up questions to to, um, to the audience, but I have one, um, you know, one other question I wanted to ask before before I do that. I mean, any questions that anyone wants to ask to, to Sigrun about, you know, writing the book, about her other work, um, you know, about translation, you know, anything that, that interests you. Um, um, but the question I had was, um, uh, you know, uh, we think of historians as having sort of a responsibility towards documents. And I think you, you've already given us a sense that maybe we're perhaps a bit too reverent about historians or, or maybe historians can take themselves too seriously in some sense. And um, you've talked about sort of Brenda Anderson, so Anderson, she could have existed, right? But yeah. she, she, she didn't. And you, you've written 17th century documents, mm. right? You sort of are creating your own documents, but those are created with a historian's yeah, knowledge, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. So when you're doing that, when you're making up history, is there a part of you that feels like that's a sort of a, uh, a sort of maybe subversive or playful act, or are you just sort of trying to join in those historical documents you 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 care about? Well, making things up about the past is 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 is, is a little bit difficult for me right. as, a, as a historian. Right, but right, yeah, but. Um, I find that uh, writing a novel and writing a non-fiction, it does involve an uh, equal amount of time going into research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's just, I did a lot of research for this book and the, my, my new novel, um, although the, the, the protagonist is, 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 is made up, everything in the, 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 the world of the, the, the story is, is, is thoroughly researched and because I I don't feel I'm obliged to do that I just don't want people to get um, a wrong idea about the the past by mm -hmm. by reading my my novel that takes place in the in the past mm -hmm. so um, yeah I, I does that yeah answer? yeah absolutely yeah so I I feel a bit bad about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right, but um, but you know, but the word story is there in in history too, right? There is the, you know, yeah. there, there is that that creativity. So thank you um, yeah. for those answers. Um, so are there audience members who who have uh, questions? Anything to to ask of either of us? Yes. Yeah. So, so the question is about sort of you know what is the process of, of, of translation and the ways in which the uh, Sigrun and I work uh, together on that and it is very much together and then also like what are some of the other 
um, difficulties that we you know, and so not just the title, but you know, other difficulties. Um, so we, we may both have different answers to this, <laughs> but um, uh, um, uh, the, with the exception of, of one book that I've translated, I, I've um, always been able to do the translations as a, as a collaboration with with, with a um, with Icelandic author, and um, and each uh, author in each book has had a different. Um, you know, different uh, uh, flavor to it, sort of, you know, different relationships. Um, but but in, in general, the process, I mean, as the Sigrun was sort of saying, I, I like to have the whole thing translated. It's not enough for me to have read it. I I, I feel I need to understand it fully, and, and that only happens when I've, I've translated every single word and, and revised it. And, and I worry sometimes that that's going to drive the authors a little bit mad because they're, they're waiting to see what I'm doing and, and it takes longer that way. Um, um, but um, but then there, there are I, I say I mean I think of it you know as a conversation there there are you know many moments of sort of you know Sigrun's very patient to sort of look over drafts um, uh, help me figure out Icelandic sentences that that are eluding me or sort of to take me um, you know back to a moment that I think I've understood but there's something key that I'm, I'm missing um, uh, there are elements in which that I think revision happens as one translates right that that. Um, uh, maybe there's a popular image of the point of translation is faithfulness, right? You've either faithfully translated the book or you've betrayed the book in some way. But but actually, it's it's much more a sort of a fluid, um, you know, finding the right way to match the you know in English the experience the Icelandic reader would have, and that's that's part of where we're each trying to guess. You know, I'm hoping I've caught the spirit of what I think an Icelandic reader would experience, and you're trying to help me with that and and trying to sort of. Um, imagine what the English reader or the American English reader might have. I'll, I'll hand over to you to pick up the answer to the question. Yeah, I mean, um, the exchanges between us was were, were endless. Uh, mm -hmm. We were just sort of, I guess we're, we're both uh, very, um, we love words and sentences. Uh -huh. right, right, right. <laughs> so we could just discuss, you know, a, a sentence back and forth and, mm -hmm. and it was it was a great fun. And, right. and, yep. and I was just so I could have gone on forever. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I can only imagine uh, how it how it would be to be because this is the first book that has been translated, and and usually uh, authors in Iceland are translated into other languages than because because uh, US and UK are the the hardest market to get into. Uh, I would say Germany and France were the easiest at the moment, and I can only imagine. Uh, a book or, or compa being translated into France or, mm. or German, you don't know anything. You just hand it over mm. to the translator, and and it could be could be all wrong. And and um, several authors have been translated into Arabic, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you don't even know if your name is on the cover. Right. It's it's right. so you you need to you need to trust your translator. But in as I know a little bit of English. It was Modern we were right. able to, and that's that's the perfect situation, really, because right. that that's that's because uh, um, you need to 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 get reflect on what you're doing and and have a conversation uh, about whether uh, the meaning is getting through. Right, right. And, and mm. Sigrun's downplaying the, you know, the, the, the extent of the, 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 the fluency in, in, in English, which was a, an incredible help in this book, because there, there, you know, there are moments where you, know, you like to think as the translator you're going to have the perfect word, and there are many moments where I, I would have a word and Sigrun would suggest another word in English. I was like, yes, no, that is, that yes. is, that is the better word there. And, um, but one of the, the common places of sort of the theory of translation, you know, what it means to become a translator as, as sort of a creative identity, is that you, you start off on that path with an anxiety. You think, you know, is my Icelandic going to be good enough? And, and that never goes away, right? You know, constantly I'm thinking, you know, is it going to be good enough? And and, um, uh, and 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 but what you realize is the more important question to be asking yourself is, is my English good enough? Because the reader's reading it in English, mm. and the the English is the language that has to capture that that atmosphere. And so, um, I think it's that shared love of words in both languages that. Um, allows us to make that, that, that connection. So um, We haven't answered the second part of that question, the difficulties part. I don't know if Sigrun has an answer to it. I tend to, there are definitely moments when I'm sort of sitting there, often late at night, you know, the kids are asleep and I'm sort of wrestling with something. And then once the book is approved by the publisher and they've done all the copy editing, my mind, I think, wipes all of that because it was so difficult at the time <laughs> and I, I have to erase it. So nothing, I, you know, do, do you remember any of the moments where we felt like we were, we were stuck or 
we couldn't um no because right. uh, no because right. it's it's it was an easy communication right it's, right it's, so. you know yeah there are i mean there are other books i've had which, which which have been harder but i think we um you know you you've translated most of the the, the, the difficult text of, of Iceland, <laughs> like uh right. <laughs> like Ófegur Sigurðsson and, and Tomas Jónsson, uh, Guðbergur, I, I just can't, uh, yeah, it's right. not not an easy, easy books that you've, you've, you've chosen or open letter have chosen for you. I mean, this, this is, a, this is a, you know, a wonderful and rich and, and, and nuanced, uh, you know, um, book and, 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 and very complex, but I had just come off translating two very eccentric 400 page books. Um, so it, it, you know, it was a it was a pleasure <laughs> to, to 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 move uh, into a different vein. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Mm. Other questions? Yeah, uh, just, just to repeat the question for those who who won't have heard it, but uh, it was a wonderful question about those those moments that sort of have a, a cultural specificity, a cultural relevance, and there's this great example in the book of the, you know, the it, the major plot points around in this notebook and what happens to it. It sort of you know only occurs because of the exact placement of a, a recycling bin of a trash bin, and and had it been put somewhere else, and 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 again, it's the sort of thing which. Um, it's particular to, to Reykjavik, perhaps, and, and you know there may be some equivalent somewhere in other cities, but it's not. Um, it's it's a, it's a very culturally specific moment, right? So then, what is the experience? How does one translate that? And, and what's the back and forth um, there? What do you have a memory of that specific moment? Um, I mean, there there are so many things that uh, people will never understand. <laughs> right, right, right. So I don't. I mean, I I I'm not particularly worried about. Uh, it's it's just, you know, if you, if you start worrying about um, the locality of the 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 book mm -hmm. that people won't understand it, and you know, the English reader won't understand it, it's it, it won't get you nowhere. It's it's just right. people have to, because um, there are so many stories in the, in the book, and you, I've I've often heard people saying you will just pick one out and and follow that thread, and, mm -hmm. and nobody, I mean, not in, even in in I. You know, for Icelandic readers, nobody will get uh, everything you're you're trying to 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 say. So, and, and, and that moment's particularly interesting for me. I mean, as you can hear, I'm not from Boston or or indeed Rochester, right? And so my my UK upbringing comes in there, where I think the the fastidiousness over where the you know what's happening with the trash and the recycling resonates with me as an as a, as an English part of me, and 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 you know, and so. I'm also doing this translation between, you know, and that, you know, that the English in, that I grew up with in the UK and the, and the English that I uh, have come into in, in, in America. Um, I think there's also a question as, as a translator. Um, where I translated a series of um, uh, of autobiographical novels by by Jon Knarr, and um, he. Um, one of the things that happens is the young protagonist in that in that book gets very interested in sort of American culture and sort of the ideas of, 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 of in, you know in the parlance of his youth of cowboys and Indians and of, of, of Donald Duck and and Yon was very keen to have all of the Icelandic place names sort of taken out and it to sort of read very smoothly to a, to an American audience and and to me it was fundamentally important that the that the English language reader had the experience of thinking wait I, I don't know what that street name is or I don't even know if that is a street name that, that this is different from my experience but I'm not just reading about somebody who grew up in the suburbs of Boston and and Jon was very gen generous and he, he saw where I was coming from there but I do think there is that that essential question for a translator is do you want the reader to forget that it's a translation which means that they're immersed in the book or do you want them to be immersed in the book but also remember that this is probably not an experience that they've grown up with, um, and there's no right answer to it, but it's it's certainly a, a you know the, your question illuminates that. Mm. So. Questions of what you may have discovered that English was particularly adept at mm. expressing, or what uh, it was not, and right, and on the contrary, what Icelandic is better at expressing. Perhaps I mean some languages mm. are good at emotional states, some are really good with landscape, there's, there are these, these flavors. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, I think Icelandic can have a more nuanced sense of time than English can have. Um, I think there's a, there's a way that things can exist in a more sort of conditional or subjunctive or hypothetical space, whereas I think sometimes in, in English, and maybe this is my experience of trying to write it, but we're often trying to sort of make sure that we know is it past present or future right we're separating those um 
one of the things the reviews for this book taught me was that something that I knew I was doing but wasn't fully doing, and again, I think Icelandic is, is more um, nuanced at this too, is, is sort of the importance of the, the passive voice, of the, of the narrator experiencing things happening to her. Um, there's a, you know, one of my, my favorite chapters that Sigrun wrote um, begins in, in, in the translation with, with the phrase, um, in a dream, my cheek is being beaten with a little hammer. Um, and this moment where the speaker's not aware, you know, it's the is being beaten, it's not someone is beating, the speaker's so unaware of things. And, and that's happening throughout the book. And I think we're, we're taught in, 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 in an American and English context when we're sort of taught in, in freshman composition at university or in school, you know, avoid the passive voice at all costs, it has yeah. to be active. And, mm. and I think, um, uh, again, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, because this is where I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm coming to Icelandic from a different point of view, but there's a, there's a flexibility there in Icelandic where um, it is important that things happen to this narrator, mm. that she doesn't always control them, but there's, it's maybe a little more pronounced in, in, in English, which perhaps works, I, I hope, for the translation. But the meaning is that nobody is, 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 is with a hammer. It's, right. it's just being hammered. Right, by. right. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah. it has to do with the meaning. It's not, yeah. not only... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are there any sort of other things that you notice in Icelandic, or even that, that English can't get, that you sort of, you know, notice that we, we, we lost because English can't get them? Um, no, not, not, not quite sitting here. Uh, um, no. But so, I mean, we just had to, to let go at, at right. some point because there, there was no way that some, right. some sentences could be translated the, the way that I... Yeah. It, it, it just and, and I guess that's what happens when right. when te when text is being translated you you it's only up to a, to a certain point that you can get the yeah. get the meaning yeah um, th you'll be talking in, in translation theory about the idea of compensation yeah. right you're going to lose something somewhere yeah, and then try and put it back in elsewhere yeah, yeah. Um, so. that's right and uh, I think a final round of applause for the audience for, for having been here tonight.